Chapter Nineteen of the Peterkin Papers, Agamemnon's Career. There had apparently been some mistake in Agamemnon's education. He had been to a number of colleges, indeed, but he had never completed his course in any one. He had continually fallen into some difficulty with the authorities. It was singular, for he was of an inquiring mind, and had always tried to figure out what would be expected of him, but had never hit upon the right thing. Solomon John thought the trouble might be in what they called the elective system, where you were to choose what study you might take. This had always bewildered Agamemnon a great deal. And how was a feller to tell? Solomon John had asked. Whether he wanted to study a thing before he had tried it, it might turn out awful hard. Agamemnon had always been fond of reading from his childhood up. He was at his book all day long. Mrs. Peterkin had imagined he would come out a great scholar, but she could never get him away from his books. And so it was in his colleges. He was always to be found in the library, reading and reading, but they were always the wrong books. For instance, the class were required to prepare themselves on the Spartan War. This turned Agamemnon's attention to the Fenians, and to study the subject he read up on Charles O'Malley and Harry Lorrequer, and some later novels of that sort, which did not help him on the subject required, yet took up all his time, so that he found himself unfitted for anything else when the examinations came. In consequence, he was requested to leave. Agamemnon always missed in his recitations, for the same reason that Elizabeth Eliza did not get on in school, because he was always asked the questions he did not know. It seemed provoking, if the professors had only asked something else. But they always hit upon the very things he had not studied up. Mrs. Peterkin felt this was encouraging, for Agamemnon knew the things they did not know in college. In colleges they were willing to take for students only those who already knew certain things. She thought Agamemnon might be a professor in a college for those students who didn't know those things. I suppose these professors could not have known a great deal, she added, or they would not have asked you so many questions. They would have told you something. Agamemnon had left another college on account of a mistake he had made with some of his classmates. They had taken a great deal of trouble to bring some wood from a distant woodpile to make a bonfire with, under one of the professor's windows. Agamemnon had felt it would be a compliment to the professor. It was with bonfires that heroes had been greeted on their return from successful wars. In this way beacon lights had been kindled upon lofty heights that had inspired mariners seeking their homes after distant adventures. As he plodded back and forward, he imagined himself some hero of antiquity. He was reading Plutarch's Lives with deep interest. This had been recommended at a former college, and he was now taking it up in the midst of his French course. He fancied even that some future Plutarch was growing up in Lynn, perhaps, who would write of this night of suffering, and glorify its heroes. For himself, he took a severe cold and suffered from chilblains, in consequence of going back and forward through the snow carrying the wood. But the flames of the bonfire caught the blinds of the professor's room, and set fire to the building, and came near burning up the whole institution. Agamemnon regretted the result as much as his predecessor, who gave him his name, must have regretted that other bonfire on the shores of Aulis that deprived him of a daughter. The result for Agamemnon was that he was requested to leave, after having been in the institution but a few months. He left another college in consequence of a misunderstanding about the hour for morning prayers. He went every day regularly at ten o'clock, but found afterward that he should have gone at half-past six. This hour seemed to him, and to Mrs. Peterkin, unseasonable, at a time of year when the sun was not up and he would have been obliged to go to the expense of candles. Agamemnon was always willing to try another college, wherever he might be admitted. He wanted to attain knowledge, however it might be found, but after going to five, and leaving each before the year was out, he gave up. 
He determined to lay out the money that would have been expended in a collegiate education in buying the encyclopedia, the most complete that he could find, and to spend his life studying it systematically. He would not content himself with merely reading it, but he would study into each subject as it came up, and perfect himself in that subject. By the time, then, that he had finished the encyclopedia, he should have embraced all knowledge, and have experienced much of it. The family were much interested in this plan of making practice of every subject that came up. He did not, of course, get on very fast in this way. In the second column of the very first page he met with A as a note in music. This led him to the study of music. He bought a flute, and took some lessons, and attempted to accompany Elizabeth Eliza on the piano. This, of course, distracted him from his work on the encyclopedia, but he did not wish to return to A until he felt perfect in music. This required a long time. Then in the same paragraph a reference was made. In it he was requested to see Keys. It was necessary, then, to turn to Keys. This was about the same time the family were moving, which we have mentioned, when the difficult subject of Keys came up that suggested to him his own simple invention, and the hope of getting a patent for it. This led him astray, as inventions before have done with master minds, so that he was drawn aside from his regular study. The family, however, were perfectly satisfied with the career Agamemnon had chosen. It would help them all, in any path of life, if he should master the encyclopedia in a thorough way. Mr. Peterkin agreed it would be, in the end, not as expensive as a college course, even if Agamemnon should buy all the different encyclopedias that appeared. There would be no spreads involved, no expense of receiving friends at entertainment in college. He could live at home, so that it would not be necessary to fit up another room as at college. At all the times of his leaving he had sold out favorably to other occupants. Solomon John's destiny was more uncertain. He was looking forward to being a doctor some time, but he had not decided whether to be an allopathic or homeopathic, or whether he could not better invent his own pills, and he could not understand how to obtain his doctor's degree. For a few weeks he acted as a clerk in a druggist store, but he could serve only in the toothbrush and soap department, because it was found he was not familiar enough with the Latin language to compound the drugs. He agreed to spend his evenings in studying the Latin grammar, but his course was interrupted by his being dismissed for treating the little boys too frequently to soda. The little boys were going through the schools regularly. The family had been much exercised with regard to their education. Elizabeth Eliza felt that everything should be expected from them. They ought to take advantage from the family mistakes. Every new method that came up was tried upon the little boys. They had been taught spelling by all different systems, and were just able to read, when Mr. Peterkin learned that it was now considered best that children should not be taught to read until they were ten years old. Mrs. Peterkin was in despair. Perhaps if their books were taken from them, even then they might forget what they had learned. But no, the evil was done. The brain had received certain impressions that could not be blurred over. This was long ago, however. The little boys had since entered the public schools. They went also to a gymnasium and a whittling school, and joined a class in music, and another in dancing. They went to some afternoon lectures for children when there was no other school, and belonged to a walking club. Still Mr. Peterkin was dissatisfied by the slowness of their progress. He visited the schools himself, and found that they did not lead their classes. It seemed to him a great deal of time was spent in things that were not instructive, such as putting on and taking off their India rubber boots. Elizabeth Eliza proposed that they should be taken from school and taught by Agamemnon from the encyclopedia. The rest of the family might help in the education at all hours of the day. Solomon John could take up the Latin grammar, and she could give lessons in French. The little boys were enchanted with the plan, only they did not want to have the study hours all the time. Mrs. Peterkin, however, had a magnificent idea. 
that they should make their life one grand object lesson. They should begin at breakfast and study everything put upon the table, the material of which it was made and where it came from. In the study of the letter A, Agamemnon had embraced the study of music, and from one meal they might gain instruction enough for a day. We shall have the assistance, said Mr. Peterkin, of Agamemnon with his encyclopedia. Agamemnon modestly suggested that he had not yet got out of A, and in their first breakfast everything would therefore have to begin with A. That would not be impossible, said Mr. Peterkin. There is Amanda, who will wait upon the table to start with. We could have am and eggs, suggested Solomon John. Mrs. Peterkin was distressed. It was hard enough to think of anything for breakfast, and impossible, if it all had to begin with one letter. Elizabeth Eliza thought it would not be necessary. All they were to do was to ask questions, as in examination papers, and find their answers as they could. They could still apply to the encyclopedia, even if it were not in Agamemnon's alphabetical course. Mr. Peterkin suggested a great variety. One day they would study the botany of the breakfast table. Another day its natural history. The study of butter would include that of the cow. Even that of the butter dish would bring in geology. The little boys were charmed at the idea of learning pottery from the cream jug, and they were promised a potter's wheel directly. "'You see, my dear,' said Mr. Peterkin to his wife, before many weeks we shall be drinking our milk from jugs made by our children. Elizabeth Eliza hoped for a thorough study. Yes, said Mr. Peterkin, we might begin with botany. That would be near to Agamemnon alphabetically. We ought to find out the botany of butter. On what does the cow feed? The little boys were eager to go out and see. If she eats clover, said Mr. Peterkin, we shall expect the botany of clover. The little boys insisted that if they were to begin the next day, that very evening they should go out and study the cow. Mrs. Peterkin sighed and decided she would order a simple breakfast. The little boys took their notebooks and pencils and clambered upon the fence, where they seated themselves in a row, for there were three little boys. So it was now supposed. They were always coming in or going out, and it had been difficult to count them, and nobody was very sure how many there were. There they sat, however, on the fence, looking at the cow. She looked at them with large eyes. She won't eat, they cried, while we are looking at her. So they turned about and pretended to look into the street, and seated themselves that way, turning their heads back from time to time to see the cow. Now she is nibbling a clover. No, that is a bit of sorrel. It's a whole handful of grass. What kind of grass? they exclaimed. It was very hard, sitting with their backs to the cow, and pretending to the cow that they were looking into the street, and yet to be looking at the cow all the time, and finding out what she was eating, and the upper rail of the fence was narrow and a little sharp. It was very high, too, for some additional rails had been put up to prevent the cow from jumping into the garden or street. Suddenly, looking out into the hazy twilight, Elizabeth Eliza saw six legs and six India rubber boots in the air, and the little boys disappeared. They are tossed by the cow! The little boys are tossed by the cow! Mrs. Peterkin rushed for the window, but fainted on the way. Solomon John and Elizabeth Eliza were hurrying to the door, but stopped, not knowing what to do next. Mrs. Peterkin recovered herself with supreme effort, and sent them out to the rescue. But what could they do? The fence had been made so high to keep the cow out, and nobody could get in. The boy that did the milking had gone off with the key of the outer gate, and perhaps with the key of the shed door. Even if that were not locked, before Agamemnon could get round by the woodshed and cowshed, the little boys might be gored through and through. Elizabeth Eliza ran to the neighbors, Solomon John to the druggist for plasters, while Agamemnon made his way through the dining-room to the woodshed and outer shed door. Mr. Peterkin mounted the outside of the fence, while Mrs. Peterkin begged him not to put himself into danger. He climbed high enough to view the scene. He held the corner post and reported what he saw. They were not gored. 
The cow was at the other end of the lot. One of the little boys were lying in a bunch of dark leaves. He was moving. The cow glared, but did not stir. Another little boy was pulling his india-rubber boots out of the mud. The cow still looked at him. And another was feeling the top of his head. The cow began to crop the grass, still looking at him. Agamemnon had reached and opened the shed door. The little boys were next seen running toward it. A crowd of neighbors with pitchforks had returned, meanwhile, with Elizabeth Eliza. Solomon John had brought the four druggist. But by the time they had reached the house, the three little boys were safe in the arms of their mother. "'This is too dangerous, a form of education,' she cried. "'I had rather they went to school.' "'No!' they bravely cried. "'They were still willing to try the other way.' 